Leaked internal government documents on biosafety obtained by NTD suggest the Chinese regime knew about human-to-human -human transmission of the virus weeks before telling the public. American scholars warning of a second virus outbreak since the number of asymptomatic cases is much higher than previously thought. China is introducing a new digital currency backed by its central bank. It's said to make payment easier and faster, but an analyst warns it could be used to tighten the regime's control of the Chinese people. A researcher in Pennsylvania working on understanding the virus now dead, police investigating it as a murder-suicide. A recent Chinese think tank article catching attention and raising debate on social media. Which U.S. candidate would China prefer in the 2020 election? And what does it mean for the future of U.S.-China relations? Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. American scholars warn of a second virus outbreak. Zhang Yujiao, a tenured professor at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, warned through Chinese media PhoenixNet that scientists believe a second outbreak will come in fall or winter. He added scientists have found that as many as 20 to 50 percent of cases are asymptomatic, more than previously thought. He also said herd immunity might become reality, meaning within two to three years, 60 to 70 percent of the population will be infected before humans naturally develop an immunity. But millions will die in the process. Now to Harbin, the capital of China's northernmost province, Heilongjiang. This video shows empty streets. The person taking the video says all restaurants are closed because of the outbreak, a ghost town. There are very few people at the market. Neighborhoods are closed off. The bus is empty. So is the shopping mall. Leaked internal government documents on biosafety obtained by NTD suggest the regime knew about human-to-human -human transmission of the virus weeks before telling the public. In a classified document issued on January 3rd, China's National Health Commission alerted all regional health commissions and top biosafety labs in the county to pathogenic microorganisms that are infectious among people. The document laid out guidelines for the prevention and control of a major sudden outbreak of infectious diseases. It doesn't specify what kind of disease, but the notice came just days after Wuhan authorities publicly confirmed the virus outbreak on December 31st. The document also prohibited such agencies from providing samples or publishing information about the virus without approval. Another classified document on biosafety issued on January 14th in Beijing also mentioned the prevention and control of a major sudden outbreak of infectious diseases. The Health Commission asked the pathogenic microbiology labs in Beijing to conduct self-evaluations on January 15th and 16th before health officials conducted random inspections from the 17th to 20th. During this time, officials insisted the risk of human-to-human -human transmission was low. On January 16th, China's National Health Commission sent a classified internal notice to regional health commissions about the virus titled Novel Coronavirus Laboratory Biosafety Guidelines. At the end of the document, it says not for public viewing. The document suggests health officials were aware of the danger the virus posed. Lab researchers were told to start using certain Level 3 biosafety protective equipment. That's the second highest classification. The guidelines were made public on January 23rd, three days after it was publicly declared there was human-to-human -human transmission. Factories in China are struggling as overseas orders fall. This video shows employees protesting at a factory in Shanghai. The company is a contractor for Apple and has 70,000 employees. Because of the outbreak, they've been forced to lay off employees. This video talks about the unemployment situation in Dongguan. It's known as the factory of the world. The people there say 8 out of 10 jobs have been lost. Anyone who can't find a job lives a very frugal life, waiting for employers who are willing to hire. On an episode of the Australian podcast Please Explain, China correspondent Eric Bagshaw weighed in on the China-Australian relationship. He says China taking a more assertive position against an investigation is an example of its wolf warrior diplomacy. 
He says China will do anything to block the investigation and has increased its pressure on Australia, even threatening economic retaliation if Australia doesn't back off. But Bagshaw added that while China has its wolf for a diplomacy, Australia has its own response, known as the Wolverine Club, which has been set up to respond forcefully and directly to any threats from China. There are even half a dozen federal parliamentarians who now have Wolverine claw marks on their offices. The UK's National Cybersecurity Centre has warned about hostile hackers targeting British universities and scientific facilities doing research on the virus. Experts say the cyber attacks come from Iran, Russia and China, but none are believed to have succeeded so far. The University of Oxford began human trials of its vaccine on April 23rd. Pharma giant AstraZeneca is teaming up with the university to mass-produce the vaccine. That's if the trials are effective. A spokesman said Oxford University is aware of cyber threats and is working closely with NCSC. With the 2020 election coming up, a recent article by a Chinese think tank has raised debates among China watchers. The article argues that China should try to win over Americans' left wing in order to fix the deteriorating U.S.-China relationship. The U.S.-China relationship is arguably at a new low. Chinese state media has called State Secretary Mike Pompeo an enemy of humankind for criticizing China. While the Trump administration has reportedly vowed to hold the Chinese regime accountable for the cover-up. With the 2020 election coming up, a recent article by a Chinese think tank has caught the attention and raised debates among China watchers on Twitter. What kind of candidate would China want? And what does it mean for the future of U.S.-China relations? The article is titled, In order to improve the U.S.-China relationship, why do we have to win over America's left wing? This came not long before President Donald Trump said he believes that Beijing will do anything they can to make him lose in 2020. The author of the article referred to those American left-wing or liberal elites who think they know a lot about China as China knowers, or Jiuhua Pai, and recounted their contribution to China's rise over the years. The article reads, if not for the Clinton government's policy to engage with China in the 1990s, how could China have had such a nice outside environment for economic growth? The article said that because the American left is too naive and arrogant, they think the U.S. engagement with China will eventually help the regime embrace more liberal democratic values. It adds that they had drawn wrong conclusions. It's exactly their mistakes that we took advantage of and won over opportunities for our own development and reduced the resistance to our uprising. The author noted that although past administrations on both the left and the right had pushed for engagement with China, the situation is different now. But today, the article read, the gap between China and the U.S. interest is too huge. There is no overlap. There is no common strategic interest. If we want to improve the two countries' relationship through America's right wing, that means we have to make huge compromises in our political system and economic model. This is something we cannot accept. The author wrote that the so-called China knowers are still really important for influencing Washington's policies. Therefore, they're still considered targets that China should try to win over. The Washington Post's China correspondent Gary Shi called the article frank and cynical, while He Qinglian, a New York-based Chinese scholar, wrote on Twitter that China is looking for substitutes for the panda huggers. The term refers to Western academics and officials who had championed engagement with China and believe that China's rise is a good thing for the world. But in recent years, some of China's previous champions have become increasingly skeptical. In 2018, over 30 of the world's top China experts published a report calling China out for its covert, coercive or corrupting operations. Many of them had previously advocated for China's rise. The report pointed out that the regime has been trying to undermine America's democratic process through its influence on the Chinese-American community, Chinese students in the U.S., American civil society organizations, academic institutions, think tanks, and the media. One China expert told the Washington Post that the report speaks to the disillusionment of an entire generation of China specialists who thought they were helping China emerge onto the world stage, only to discover that the project had gone badly awry. A Taiwanese scholar called the report a collective awakening of China experts. It remains to be seen how deep this awakening will run, but the Chinese regime's influence on Washington's China policies over the years cannot be dismissed. 
Chinese state media reported that in November 2008, right after the presidential election result was revealed, a research institute under the U.S. State Department reached out to their Chinese counterparts. It asked for their expectation lists on China policies. The new president received the report immediately after he took power in January 2009. The report is titled The Pivotal Relationship, How Obama Should Engage China. Half of it was written by a researcher named Liu Xuecheng from the China Institute of International Studies, an institute under the Chinese regime's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The researcher told state media that although it's partly his report, it actually represents China. It's common for newly elected presidents to receive policy advice reports. But one co-authored by a Chinese national under the regime's central government is unprecedented in U.S. history. New York-based China scholar He Qinglian wrote at the time that it was no different than telling Beijing, Please let me know how shall I work with you in order to satisfy you. The policy report asked the White House to respect China's core interests, to work with the Chinese regime on Taiwan issues, and not to arrange meetings with Tibetan activists. The 2009 report expressed hope that the new administration will make its broad points in public, but save its specific human rights questions, those about particular individuals, for private deliberations with the Chinese. The messages appear to have been well received. During then, President Obama's visit to China in 2009 and his receiving Xi Jinping's visit to Washington in 2015, Obama had faced criticisms for his softer stance on China's human rights issues. His administration officials reassured the media that the then-president pulled no punches in private meetings. But some say the reality we are facing today clearly proves that the behind-closed-doors approach hasn't worked and needs changing. Where China wants to keep these issues is behind closed doors. I notice your pre many of your previous diplomatic uh, in, uh, diplomats who testified say, we're working very hard behind closed doors uh, to press the case of the two Michaels and other issues. Well, that's exactly where China wants to keep it, is behind closed doors. I think, personally, um, going public uh, about China's egregious behavior on a wide range of issues, whether it's Tibet, the Uyghurs, uh, the two Michaels, Liu Xiaobo, you name it, China just hates being internationally called out publicly and shamed. The U.S. is now suffering due to the Chinese regime's lack of transparency and totalitarian rule. China's silencing of whistleblowers and citizen journalists left the world in the dark for months about the severity of the current virus pandemic. As the 2020 U.S. election approaches, President Trump and presumptive Democratic nominee Joe Biden are now in a race to see who can be tougher with China. Trump, who has long pledged to bring manufacturing back from overseas, is reportedly ramping up efforts to remove supply chains from China. He's also said to be weighing new tariffs to punish Beijing's handling of the virus outbreak. At the same time, Biden has criticized Trump in a campaign ad for trusting China too much. The Wall Street Journal recently reported that the former vice president's current foreign policy advisors are almost all veterans of the Obama administration. Biden has yet to come up with specifics of his China policies. Reporting by Penny Joe, NTD News. China is introducing a new digital currency backed by its central bank. It's said to make payments faster and easier. But an analyst warns it could be used to tighten the regime's control of the Chinese people. NTD's Catherine Wen has the details. China is testing a new digital currency with a pilot program. It's set to be the first digital currency used by a major economy. After years of development, the program began last month in four Chinese cities. Starting in May, some government workers will receive part of their paychecks in the digital currency. To use it, they need to install an app. The currency's value is pegged to the yuan. Unlike other cryptocurrencies, the digital yuan is issued and backed by the Chinese central bank. It's not decentralized and won't provide the same anonymity as other cryptocurrencies do. It's not an independent currency itself. It's just a digital version of the Chinese renminbi. In fact, there's always a central authority in this digital renminbi system. But that's the Chinese communist regime. According to a professor from the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School, the new digital currency aims to replace Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies with a system controlled by government authorities. Tang says due to its centralized structure, it would give the authorities more control over the everyday lives of Chinese people. The government can directly control each person's wallet and decide how you can spend your own money. For example, let's say the government paid you a salary of 3,000 yuan. If needed, it can impose a restriction on your money, making it so you can only spend 1,000 yuan on rice. 
He added the system could also be used to suppress dissidents, restrict their access to necessities, or in extreme cases, seize personal property. Officials say the digital yuan will make paying easier and faster for the Chinese people. But Tang says the Chinese regime is testing how much control it can exert over individual financial activity. He says the regime also has another motive. The Chinese communist regime has a goal and a plan. Once this technology matures, the regime can use the system to replace the U.S. dollar. It is trying to compete for dominance with the U.S. in the global financial system. The former governor of China's central bank said last year that the digital currency would eventually be integrated into China's Belt and Road Initiative. China has been pushing to make the yuan international, but the U.S. dollar still makes up about 60 percent of foreign exchange reserves worldwide. In contrast, the Chinese yuan only makes up about 2 percent. Reporting by Catherine Wen, NTD News. In Pennsylvania, a researcher working on the CCP virus was found dead with several gunshot wounds. Police believe it was a homicide, and the suspect appears to have killed himself afterwards. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on the case. 37-year-old Bing Lu was found dead in his Ross Township home on May 2nd. The University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine said the researcher was on the verge of making very significant findings related to the CCP virus. The researcher had gunshot wounds in the head, neck, and other parts of his body. On May 4th, the Ross Police Department said they believe his death was a homicide. Not far from Bing's home, the body of another man was found inside a car. The police said it appeared to be a self-inflicted shot to the head, so police suspect that he shot and killed Bing, went to his car, and then killed himself. The two men knew each other, but the police department said they have no information to say that his death was related to his work on the virus. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. U.S. spy planes may be pulled out of Britain because the country has allowed Huawei to build part of its 5G network. The White House is said to be reviewing whether the U.S. needs to remove its intelligence assets over security concerns. Britain's use of Chinese telecom technology may complicate the special relationship between the U.S. and the U.K. The National Security Council is said to be reviewing whether U.S. intelligence assets and personnel need to be pulled out of Britain, according to British newspaper The Telegraph. The report states the Trump administration is assessing all U.S. military and intelligence assets in Britain after the country allowed Chinese telecom giant Huawei to build part of its 5G network. Huawei is closely connected to the Chinese Communist Party. Under China's National Intelligence Law of 2017, the company has to share information with the regime if ordered to do so. That means sensitive U.S. intel shared with the U.K. over Huawei-built wireless networks could be compromised. A group of RC-135 spy planes are thought to be at the highest risk of having their information stolen. They carry a great deal of technical equipment and are known as flying computers. In the flight deck, two pilots and two navigators fly the plane, and about 17 crew members in the cabin analyze frequencies that listen out from the antennas on the side of the fuselage. The RC-135s have satellite comm links on the spine and sensors that pick up radar and communications under the fuselage. For decades, the economic, military, and intelligence bond between the U.S. and U.K. has been considered unparalleled among world powers. Winston Churchill coined the phrase special relationship between the two countries in 1946. Yet Britain's decision to allow Huawei in may challenge this relationship. There is hope, however, that Prime Minister Boris Johnson will reverse his decision as it has not yet been written into law. A unique situation in California business owners, county officials and residents are tuning out guidance from their governor. The governor says retail and other businesses can start reopening later this week, but some aren't willing to wait. California appears to be in limbo, with the stay-at-home order in place, but it doing little to keep people from reopening. Some counties there started to reopen yesterday. In rural counties, people are more spread out. It's, it's different kind of living conditions than maybe urban areas. The county's decision came before Newsom's guidance on his reopening plan to start this week. We are entering into the next phase this week. End of the week, with modifications, uh, we will allow retail to start uh, operating across the spectrum and some moving even quicker to get business going again. This gym reopened on Friday, well ahead of the governor's plans. Those two things, mental health and freedom. Like, at the end of the day, it's freedom. 
there haven't been any calls to shut it down. And some say there may be a reason for that. Well, as funny as it may sound, I heard that half of the, half of the cops work out here. And you know, we actually talked to, uh, we talked to a couple of cops the other day down at the gas station, and they said, oh, we're not gonna shut Jake down. Also opening two Orange County beaches. After a fleeting shutdown over the weekend, the governor ordered beaches to close Friday. But after a weekend of protests and local authorities showing their plans for enforcing social distancing, now the governor says people can use the beaches for what he calls active recreation. Melina Wisecup, NTD News. Most states are reopening or planning to do so by mid-May. Now Virginia may be one of them, moving faster towards recovery than anticipated. That's not the case in Michigan, where the governor is now facing yet another lawsuit for how she's handled the pandemic. Virginia seems to be moving ahead quicker than anticipated. The stay-at-home order, originally set to end in June, was the longest of any state. Now that order may be updated with exceptions. Weak. Based on the data, I expect that we may be able to enter it as soon as next week. The governor says reopening could start by May 15th. On the same day, New York is set to reopen in some areas. New cases and hospitalizations there continue to drop. There's no doubt that we're coming down the mountain. And in Michigan, residents again take to the courts over their governor's orders. That makes at least the third lawsuit filed against Governor Whitmer since the outbreak began. One congressman says her emergency orders violate the separation of powers between the legislative and executive branches. And in Ohio, the stay at home is extended until the end of the month, but some businesses were able to reopen yesterday. The state is now advising employers to report people who choose not to return to work, so unemployment benefits won't be given to people who are choosing not to work without good reason. While some Ohio businesses are reopening, another Walmart in Massachusetts is closed after a virus outbreak among employees. Although the state is still seeing thousands of hospitalizations, the Massachusetts governor says the numbers are starting to trend down. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. Just over 71,000 Americans have lost their lives to the CCP virus, while nearly 200,000 have recovered. And in New York City, bodies are being stored in freezer trucks to prevent funeral homes from being overwhelmed. The trucks sit along a pier in Brooklyn, where they will serve as a long-term disaster morgue. At this Brooklyn Pier in New York City, bodies of deceased people are being stored in freezer trucks to give funeral directors relief amidst the CCP virus pandemic. Of the reported 27 freezer truck trailers positioned along the pier, 30% have already been filled as of Monday. The city originally planned on sending the bodies to Hart Island for temporary burial, but it's now having these icy trailers do the job. Currently, funeral directors are struggling to provide services to those who have lost their loved ones to the virus. The number of bodies coming in are overwhelming, with most coming from nursing homes. According to the Epoch Times, 1,700 more virus deaths have been linked to nursing homes as of Monday. Brooklyn's 39th Street Pier, where the bodies are being stored, says it will extend its hours so that funeral homes can claim bodies. New York City is closing more streets to traffic so New Yorkers can enjoy the warmer weather and still have enough space to social distance. The city's parks were not enough. New York City has closed some streets to vehicle traffic, expanded sidewalks and created temporary bike lanes to offer New Yorkers more space to stay apart outside. This as CCP virus lockdown measures continue. Right, we have all the beautiful weather and free time on a beautiful block, free space, kids get to do what they want and I get to give them more independence than I ever would. What does it feel like to, to skateboard down a totally empty New York City street? I'm good because then no one's gonna block me. Good because my mom can't boss me around for where I can go. Yay! Pedestrians strolled around, walked their dogs, skateboarded, biked, and enjoyed the warm weather while walking in the middle of closed off streets on Monday. The extra space can be found on East End Avenue from 83rd to 89th Streets. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio said last week that the city would create a minimum of 40 miles of open streets. He said the city would focus on streets in and around parks, where officials expect people to congregate as the weather gets warmer. It's nice because there's a little bit more space, 
super weird because it's still New York City and there's still cars coming. And then you factor in that we're just part of the new normal. So that it could be, they can have, they can social distance a little more because so, in the park it's a little crowded. Out here you have the park and the street. So I feel it's going to be pretty good. I have a good feeling about this. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo has announced a four-phase plan for reopening New York. He said the manufacturing and construction industries would be among the first to get back to work. President Trump has remained at the White House for much of the last two months. But today he's headed to Arizona to visit a mask factory that's ramped up production. The White House says the Honeywell Aerospace faculty is expanding its production of N95 masks to meet the high demand needed for health care workers amid the pandemic. The last time the president left his residence, with exceptions to Camp David and the Lincoln Memorial, was in late March. That's when he watched the USNS hospital ship depart from its home naval base in Norfolk, Virginia, on its way to New York. White House officials are also taking precautions to try to prevent Trump and Vice President Mike Pence from exposure to the virus. In June, the president is expected to deliver a commencement address at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. And Britain has overtaken Italy with the highest official death toll in Europe. But according to the British government, it may be too soon to count on numbers from other countries. Britain has overtaken Italy in reporting the highest official death toll in Europe, now with 32,000 casualties. The announcement could increase political pressure on the UK government, which is already under fire for the virus response, some say came too late. But the government defended itself, saying that only when the pandemic is over will the final death toll of other countries be available. Workers wearing personal protective equipment suits were seen burying two closed coffins at a cemetery in St. Petersburg, Russia. Local news reported that this particular section of the graveyard was specially designated for victims of the virus. The rapid increase of cases in the Amazon region is worrying authorities in Brazil and Colombia. Their lack of infrastructure puts indigenous communities at greater danger of infection. The mayor of Manaus, the capital of the Brazilian state of Amazonas, asked environmental activist Greta Thunberg for help in collecting donations. The funds will go toward helping the city fight the virus. The Chicago Federal Reserve president expects growth in the U.S. economy for the second half of 2020. Walgreens stores restore standard operating hours and more in business news. Chicago Federal Reserve President Charles Evans said Tuesday it's reasonable to expect the U.S. economy to return to growth in the second half of the year. He says the pickup in activity will be slow at first, but that some businesses could get back to the productivity levels they had before the virus pandemic. The United States and Britain launched the first round of negotiations for a free trade agreement, with their trade representatives pledging to work quickly online to reach a deal. The talks will involve over 300 U.S. and U.K. staff and officials. A joint statement says the deal will also help the countries recover from economic fallout over the CCP virus. Drugstore chain Walgreens says it's going back to standard operating hours at most of its stores across the U.S. beginning Tuesday. The company operates over 9,000 drugstores. It cut operating hours in March at most locations following the virus pandemic. Certain stores in tourist regions, downtown city centers, or markets with curfews will continue to operate under reduced hours. Shares of online furniture retailer Wayfair soared as much as 35 percent to a record high on Tuesday after posting better than expected quarterly results. The stay-at-home orders have boosted demand for furniture products. Wayfair saw a pickup in both traffic and sales starting mid-March. Its executives say the sales momentum carried into the current quarter with quarter-to-date gross revenue growth trending up roughly 90 percent from a year earlier. Carnival Cruise Line says some of its ships will be heading out to sea again on August 1st, just one week after a no-sale order is set to expire. Carnival Cruise Line said it will start its gradual return to service. The ships will depart from three ports, Miami, Port Canaveral, Florida, and Galveston, Texas. But the cruise line is also extending its suspension of service from other North American and Australian ports until the end of August. The company says it's reaching out to customers who already have tickets for that time period to offer them alternatives. Carnival also says it will use the time before returning to service to improve health safety measures for its passengers and crews. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention issued a no-sale order in March, banning Carnival and all cruise lines from sailing from U.S. ports. 
The CDC later extended the order to July 24th. New Zealand's Prime Minister joined Australia's coronavirus cabinet meeting today as the neighboring countries discuss a travel bubble between them. Australia and New Zealand discussed a travel bubble between the two on Tuesday. Both countries have been planning a safe zone of travel that would allow residents to travel between the countries without a mandatory quarantine period on arrival. But Australian leader Scott Morrison didn't give a date for when Aussies and Kiwis can take again to the skies. The Prime Minister and I have been now for several weeks been talking about a safe travel zone between Australia and New Zealand. Um, it is still some time away, but it is important to flag it because it is part of the road back. New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern joined Australia's coronavirus cabinet meeting on Tuesday and also said no rush decision would be made until both countries were confident that the virus was at bay. I think uh, simply the position that I would take on behalf of New Zealand is that when we feel comfortable and confident that we both won't receive cases from Australia, but equal that we, equally that we won't export them, then that will be the time to move. New Zealand recorded no new coronavirus cases for a second day in a row on Tuesday. Meanwhile, rules on social distancing have been rolled back in some Australian states and territories. However, restrictions on large gatherings and non-essential travel are still in place. Here at China In Focus, we dedicate ourselves to bringing you truthful, unbiased reporting. Don't forget to subscribe for the latest updates and see you tomorrow.